Yep. So, hi everyone. Thank you for joining today's live technical topic webinar. Um, I hope everyone is well. My name is Riley um, and I assist in coordinating our various free webinars that we hold every month at EIT. Um, so you can find all of our upcoming and past webinars on the events page on our website. Um, just before we start, I'd like to run over one thing and that's just disabling the sound and the pop-up notifications. Um, so if you're not familiar with the webinar platform, um, it can be a little bit intrusive while we're trying to watch. Um, so it's just best to disable it beforehand. Um, so you'll just need to go into uh, the settings and um, that if you're on desktop, that should be in the right bottom right-hand corner of the screen. Um, or you might need to go to the hamburger menu if you're on mobile and go to notification settings and untick all the boxes. So that will disable the, uh, the pop-up notifications and the sounds. And moving on. So today's session, we'll be uh, discussing a topic that um, Akta has, uh, has proposed, and uh, that is the feasibility of converting overhead transmission lines to underground. And it will be focusing on an Australian uh, case study. Um, and as mentioned, Professor Akta Kalam um, will be presenting um, this technical webinar for us today. And uh, we like to keep these webinars as interactive as possible. So please use the chat box if you have any questions or thoughts that you'd like to share during the session. Um, I'll be active in the chat box for most of the webinars so I can answer any non-academic questions for you. Um, so just going over some uh, common questions. Uh, so in terms of the slides and the video recording of this webinar, um, everyone that is registered for this webinar uh, will receive um, the slides and the video recording via email, um, likely in the next business day, uh, with one, one or two business days. Um, so that so that includes everyone that is currently in the live session now or uh, wasn't able to make the live session today. And there is also a certificate of attendance that can be provided to attendees who request one at the end of the session. Um, so there will be a link um, and a QR code provided uh, in which uh, we'll take you to a short form of survey um, that uh, you'll need to complete in order to receive one. Um, so those certificates will also be sent in the next one to two business days. Um, and just to give you a brief overview of EIT before we start today's technical webinar. Um, so we're engineering specialist uh, education provider. Uh, so we have a range of courses in engineering uh, from, uh, from a short non-accredited courses, uh, which we call professional certificates. Um, and then we also have uh, a range of um, accredited qualifications such as uh, diplomas, advanced diplomas, um, and also in the higher education uh, aspect, we've got um, undergraduate and graduate certificates, bachelor's and master's degrees, and recently a doctor of engineering. Um, so all of our programs are updated regularly to stay um, up to date with industry, and uh, some of our courses are also um, internationally accredited. Um, you can find more details about our accreditation on our website. And uh, all of our lecturers, um, so we, we employ uh, industry experienced lecturers um, who not only have experience in academia, but also um, out in the real world and, um, and can directly relate their experiences to the content they're teaching to provide a better quality uh, learning experience. And we have a unique delivery model, um, such as uh, these live webinars. If you're, uh, if you're studying online with us, uh, you'll be uh, in webinar platforms such as these. Um, and we also have uh, state-of-the-art technologies such as uh, workshop, remote laboratories and simulation software. Uh, to cover the practical learning side of things. And 
I would just like to um, hand over now to Professor Akhtar Kalam, who I've mentioned is our uh, chairman of the uh, EIT Academic Board. Uh, so I'll now pass over to you. Thank you very much, Akhtar. Thank you very much, uh, Riley, for the kind introduction. Um, uh, that's me. Uh, you see that. Um, uh, that photograph is about 200 years old, so I'm not young anymore. I wanted to make sure that you understand it. You're talking to an old man. And um, so, uh, but uh, just to let you know that um, I'm committed to engineering and um, therefore I'm very pleased to be talking about a topic which is very dear to me. Uh, thank you very much for uh, all of you and good afternoon to all of you. Good morning, good day, as we call it in Australia. That fits in very well with everyone. Uh, now, this presentation is a bit long, so I'll go right to the nitty gritty of the presentation. Uh, let me tell you what I want to do. Uh, I want to talk about a state called Waverly Park State, and I'll, I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, then I'll talk about the 220 kV high voltage transmission line, which is going over there on through that state. And then how I did this study and, and what conclusion I came up with. Um, first of all, um, this is the, the whole place that uh, we are looking at. Um, we are looking at, uh, uh, at this, uh, this particular um, site that is there in, in, in east, southeast of Melbourne. And um, if, you, if you look carefully, if you look carefully at this one, um, this used to be a football ground. And uh, just to make sure that you understand, this is Australian football that I'm talking about. Uh, and this is the Australian Football League. Australian Football League is a, is a, is a biblical type of thing in Australia. And, and very important that you realize that. But this uh, particular thing had a 530 meters of uh, overhead line that goes through that state. And I'll show you how the football ground looks like. This is how the football ground was. And, and these were all the stadium that is there, all the stands. It's a huge football ground. It, it could take about uh, 70 to 80,000 people in there. And um, we changed that to, we went to the Melbourne cricket ground in the city and, and that was sold. That estate was sold and that's why. It used to be called Waverly football ground it became Waverly Park State. One of the reasons that it was sold uh, was to earn revenue for the government uh, because the football ground was relocated and it was a, it was a prime state and, and therefore it was sold to the, uh, to the highest bidder. And, and the builder who bought it was Mirvac. Mirvac happens to be the largest construction company in Australia. And, and they're very powerful and, and very strong builder. And, and one of the clause in the, in the contract sale was that they will put this overhead line underground. And when this thing sold, it was sold in various sections. And where the overhead line was there, it was sold in the last section. Unfortunately or fortunately, whatever happened, the underground cabling was not done and there was a breach of trust from the builder to the government. The state government changed hand from one government to the other. The present opposition party leader was then the planning minister. His name is Matthew Guys. And um, um, uh, he was then in the government and um, the, uh, that comes from the Liberal Party and the Labour were in opposition. And then when this case came up, Labour was in office and somehow no the other, Labour agreed that uh, they do not change this uh, overhead line. And they, therefore this was a very long drawn case. Uh, many consultants were appointed. I was appointed by, um, by Matthew Guys at that time uh, through Monash Council 
uh, to look at uh, as, as a neutral party with no interest in it, uh, as a consultant to look at, at the feasibility of putting the overhead line underground. So I learned a lot of thing in this particular issue. And there were documents um, as thick as about uh, 12 inches of documents that I had to go through, thousands and thousands of pages of documents that I went through. It was a huge learning exercise, but the beauty was that I, I gave my report and somehow or the other that when the report went, the government changed hands and when the government changed hands, that report was not considered when the tribunal set, sat. And um, it was something happened, the report disappeared uh, and the builder was allowed to continue building without putting the overhead line underground, which was the original reason why they got that property. And um, uh, later on, the those who were the tenants sued, I was also made an expert witness from the tenant side next. Again, I put the report and this is the result of that report. Again, the tenants, it went through the tribunal and the tenants lost and the builder won. And this is what happened. The idea was that, um, uh, that uh, and this was in 2002, uh, the Mirvac, as I told you, the builders, they promised that they will bury that 220 kV line, which was going through the middle of the state, that they will put it underground. They came up with an excuse that uh, the cost has gone too high in 2015 and they are not going to put this lattice tower and they wanted to replace it with a smaller steel monopole structure in 2018. Um, as I told you the first time, the government agreed to that there'd be no need of making the change. Uh, but um, the tribunal decided that because those who have bought the property, they should be paid compensation. And uh, this is what the this is what the line looked like. This is a going through the middle of the state. This line, and this is directly from the uh, that this high tension line remained overground and it violated the principle by which they got the property and and homeowners and there were people who were retired who wanted to go to another state came over there because it was close to all amenities it's a very vibrant community over there in monarch city council in waverly park itself with close amenities to everything and uh, it is literally in the center of Melbourne. Uh, and homeowners bought properties over there on the anticipation that that overhead line will be underground. And it was not done. And the homeowners were furious about this. There was some sort of um, appeasement when the court decided that um, uh, the homeowner should be paid compensation. And you'll be surprised, the market capitalization of Mirvac is about $12 billion. This is according to the Australian stock exchange. But they did not pay $84,000 as part of compensation package for a broken promise to Waverly Park owners, and which was agreeable to the court. So my first thing is that, what is the problem? The problem is that, very simple, I was asked to find an alternative. I was asked to find an underground solution to the original proposal, which was advanced by Mirwak. Although broadly the same as Mirwak, so my proposal was no different. But I used a model from New Zealand. 
which is the 220 kV Brown Hill Road substation, which is located in New Zealand, in Auckland. From a public amenities perspective, the Brown, Hole, Brown Hill Road scenario is very similar to the existing one in Waverley Park. And is very much superior in terms of visual amenities, open space, and financial cost. Now, let me tell you some preliminaries. Let's get this right. If you think this is the first time in the history of the world that we are going to put overhead lines to underground, you, you're sadly mistaken. This has been done all around the world. 220 kV line up to 500 kV line all around the world has been put underground, especially in highly urbanized areas for many decades. It's not a new thing. It is very common practice that high voltage transmission line, okay, to be diverted into underground cables, especially in cities, the dwellings, in urban dwellings, in industrial settings. And with the pressure of environmental concern, this has become more demanding. And therefore, you can see thousands of kilometers of underground cables using both long and short distance have been installed all over the world. I'll give you some examples. And by the way, now new materials, new processing techniques, new installation techniques, and steady reductions in relative cost have all contributed to the growth in the popularity of underground cables. I still remember those days, uh, in the early days, in the early 2000s, when we used to say that underground cabling is only possible up to 66 kilovolts. Now you can go up to 400 kilovolts, no problem, you can get it. We used to say that uh, undergrounding uh, overhead lines will be three times more expensive instead of using ACSR, if you use XLPE, it is three times more expensive. It's no longer true. It is very much in ball. As a matter of fact, at the moment, it is at par with uh, ACSR overhead lines. So um, underground cables have advantages, my friends, especially from reliability point of view, life expectancy point of view, from maintenance point of view, and from operation cost point of view. So if you look at the at a specific um, situation and, and at social context, either tower-mounted terminations or practical transition enclosures, it can be done. You can put. 220 kV overhead line underground with least visual amenity impact. And the most economical means of doing this is to ensure that the chosen infrastructure utilizes the latest technology and installation techniques. So don't depend on the old techniques. And the infrastructure footprint and associated tower pole height has to be minimized. And that is the trick of the game. Now, uh, the question is that what technology is available? I told you that uh, now the technology is very well advanced. Even at that time, when we're talking about 2012, 2018, at that time also, okay, Economic considerations were not that difficult. And you will find that overhead lines and underground cables were not much difference from economical point of view. And um, if someone tells me that EHV underground cable systems are were not there, I'm sorry to say, has been there for quite a bit of time. Naturally, there has been some restrictions in providing interconnection between overhead transmission lines and specified location within cities, urban and industrial areas. 
In fact, whenever the environmental concerns were there, underground cable came very well in advance, especially when you wanted to improve your transmission network. And in many countries, thousands of kilometers of underground high voltage and EAT cables already exist. And these are anything between 2 to 20 kilometers. You remember, I was talking about 520 meters only. So it is well within that range between 2 to 20 kilometers. Today, I can tell you right now that we have got many underground and subsea cable, which is between 50 to 150 kilometers in length. Naturally, you have to consider special factors while when you are designing these of links compared to normal consideration which is associated with shorter links now um, as i told you in the beginning and i repeat again remember there are new materials there processing technology has improved dramatically there are huge amount of advancement in the ancillary equipment and, and installation techniques and they're all available today and they can overcome many of the problems of where people talk about capacitance and dielectric losses relatively low current rating compared to overhead line to such an extent that constraint on maximum length and power transfer have become less important than what it was thought previously Now, the Victorian system. I just wanted to give you an example of Victoria itself. For those of you who are from outside Australia, Victoria is one of the states in, in the eastern part of Australia, southeast of Australia. It's a small state compared to New South Wales and Queensland. But the two big cities which are there in, in Australia is Sydney and Melbourne. I come from Melbourne. And you will find that uh, we do have a history of underground cabling in our state. We have 15 circuits of EHV transmission line, 220 kV line, and uh, there are about uh, 11 kilometers of EHV lines. We've got 66 kV line of about 5 kilometers. And then there are medium voltage lines 22 11 and 6.6 .6 kv lines so we've got a lot of these lines already in the state of victoria uh, you know i mean um, if you look at it uh, we also have three interconnecting underground cables which is 220 kv cables and 166 kv cable we have got a 220 kv interconnecting cable between the Brunswick Terminal Station in Victoria and Richmond Terminal Station. And also between Eildon Terminal Station and Thomastown Terminal Station. We've got all these interconnection lines. We have got a 66 kV interconnecting cable operating between Loyang Substation and Loyang South Substation. This type of cable incorporates sectionalized joints and an associated metallic sheet cross-bounding system at the centrally located joint bay. All these three interconnecting cables use a single core construction. The 220 kV Brunswick to Richmond cable is XLP insulated, whereas the other two cables are paper or oil insulated. There are approximately 172 station cables installed within various terminal stations throughout my state in Victoria. These are all single length cables that has no joints and are typically but not solely single core construction with a dispersion of XLPE or paper or oil insulation material. So it is not something which is absolutely new. We already have it. And this is the type of cables. And as I told you, if you look at the summary of the cable that we have already, you would find EHV cables makes up to about 49% of the cable population. 24% are high voltage cable and 27% are medium voltage power cable. 
So we all have a history. Now comes, look at the, at the one that has been illustrated very nicely by the Canadian website, Rita, which lists examples of many successful, very 400 kV and 500 kV lines, which are in existence in Asia, Europe, and the Middle East. And, and these are the, the 400 cable, 400 kV cable that you can see. You find that in 1980, there was a total of 1,400 kilometer of cable in 17 countries, which included Australia, Austria, Belgium, Denmark, Finland, France, Germany, Greece, Ireland, Italy, Japan, Netherlands, Portugal, South Korea, Spain, Sweden, and UK. Individual projects were from 0.4 to 44 kilometer length and from 63 to 500 kV in force. There are hundreds of other examples from around the world of successfully buried high voltage power lines. So we are not the first one to do it. Other parts of the world have been doing, look at all the 400 and 500 kV lines in China, Russia, Sudan, Egypt, Colombia. And these have been there progressively. Look at the year, anything from 1999 to 2011. So we've got a lot of examples of such type of cables. So we were not doing rocket science. Now coming to the ability of 220 kV high voltage power lines as of 2012. Remember, this Waverly Park had 220 kV overhead line. And you cannot deny the fact that transmission line up to 500 kV has been diverted underground in many countries. And I've told you, I've given you the RITA website. And the RITA website says, the fact is there are thousands of examples of successfully buried 240 kV transmission lines and lines of lower voltage. Many cities and towns around the world have many miles and kilometers of buried high voltage lines, especially in downtown area and in densely populated area. The inescapable conclusion is that in 2012, well-honed ability to successfully underground 220 kV high voltage power lines was there. So there was no reason why this project could fail. And let us look at this one, which is, um, which is a very interesting one. And this is very similar to the one in, uh, in the Waverly Park. This is what was done in, in Italy. If you look at it, this line which is there, the Turbigo row line, is a combination of overhead lines and underground cable. And they underground 2.4 kilometer of line. Look at that portion, the 200, the 2.4 kilometers between Rio and that substation. And it's very similar to the situation in Waverly Park, except that in Waverly Park, the 2.4 kilometers was only about 0.5 kilometers. So some of the features that are there, some of the features which are there are, are very, very clear um, and 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 look at that uh, the, the features are absolutely clear and and uh, if you want to look at the summary of the type of cables which are there you can think in XLPE which is cross-link polyethylene cable the gas insulated line and high temperature superconductor the high temperature superconducting may not be very feasible in Australia because of our long line. But there is ongoing demand for reliable electricity in terms of supply and distribution. Underground cable utilizing XLPE have the potential to reduce outages, the maintenance cost and transmission losses in the best and the most effective environmentally friendly way possible. In general, transmission losses are much lower. And modern technology makes underground cable a more practical solution 
to improve reliability where this option were not available in the past. The gas insulated lines and the high temperature superconductor cable technology does help for a massive increase of power transmission capacity, capacity with its unique characteristic of the low impedance and low ohmic losses. I know that high temperature superconductor cable has the potential of becoming a reasonable solution for new transmission line. However, we must re remember these do have environmental benefits because there is no thermal or magnetic field emission and there is no visual impact at all. And economic benefits are there, my friends, where civil works are reduced by the avoidance of unnecessary digging. In addition, underground cable reduces the risk of bushfires. In Australia, we do have a lot of bushfires. And there is, we can deliver big savings in tree pruning costs. All in all, in addition to the various other advantages that I've mentioned here, I can tell you underground cable results in 220 kV high voltage power lines have the least visual amenity impact. So all these advantages which are there, you've got maximum power rating, you can do regulatory clearance, you can look at all type of reliability issue, the XLP cables, you can do all the, the EMI effect, all that is reduced, losses are reduced and congestion has been elevated. The Example that I wanted to follow was the one that was in New Zealand. In New Zealand, undergrounding of 1300 meters of underground Henderson Otaho 220 kV line occurred in 2007. If you look at that figure, that's what they did. That green thing that you see. The termination option that the Hillsborough end was limited. The existing line that you see is in green and the new cable line is shown in orange. This is the new cable line. Now, let me show you what uh, Mirvac proposed. Let me show you what Mirvac proposed. Mirvac the builders, they proposed two transition enclosures, one at each end of the Waverley Park. And um, I'm, I'm getting some questions, but I can't read the question and finish my presentation. I will answer all the questions. The two enclosures, one adjacent to Jackson's Road and the other adjacent to Monash Freeway, it's two end of the line. They were to contain the same electrical infrastructure, the size of the compound surrounding. The infrastructure would be significantly different. In 2015, Waverly Park Transmission Line Advisory Committee report provided a description of the event that shaped the initial Mirvac strategy for dealing with the 220 kV transmission line crossing the Mirvac or the Waverly Park state. So the electrical infrastructure that they had. This is the proposal on one side of the street, which is the Jackson Road. They wanted to propose, look at that, they pro wanted to propose six. They wanted to propose, uh, can you see? They wanted to propose six. They wanted to propose six. Um, That's what they wanted to do. They wanted to do that six. Um, six staggered height poles that were going to have anything between 17 meters, 22.1 meters, and 30 meters. And the footprint was about 4,600 square meters. And on the Monash Freeway transmission, the other side, they proposed to have again six staggered high poles, 17 meters, 22.1 meters, and 30 meters. 
having a footprint of 8,700 square meters. So that was on the other side. Now, look at some of the things which has been done before. Look at the one in, in Barajas Airport in, Sport, in Spain. That's a termination station, termination station system of a 220 kV cable. Look at what has happened of 245 kV in, in Canadian highway. And um, so it's, it's not something, this is rocket science that's done for the first time. So Mirvac proposed, as I told you, they needed a large compound. On one side was 4,600 square meters, on the other side was 8,700 square meters. And they wanted six staggered height poles, 17, 22.1, and 30 meters each. However, a more practical one I found was in New Zealand. And the owner was Transpower New Zealand. And um, there was a Transpower New Zealand was the owner. And they looked at that station that I was telling you about right in the beginning, the Brown Hill. Uh, and um, yes, uh, someone asked about cost. I will come about the cost in a minute, please. Give me some time. Transpower New Zealand, which is the owner of the Brown Hill Road substation in the southeastern Auckland suburb of Whitford. The termination is part of 186 meter double circuit 400 kV Bakamaru to Brown Hill Road transmission substation. The line, which is predominantly an overhead cable, currently operates at 220 kV but will be up upgraded to 400 kV by 2030. The underground cable has a length of 11 kilometers and runs from Brown Hill Road to Pakuranga substation in eastern. Auckland. The Brown Hole Road Station was commissioned in 2012. Now look at the at the way the Brown Hole, the Brown Hill Road substation infrastructure was. It consisted of four poles. Remember that I was talking about six poles, which was what was suggested by Mirvac. Each of them had a uniform height of 20 meters. Mirvac had 17 meters, 22 meters, and 30 meters. Mirvac had a footprint of from 4,600 square meter to 8,400 square meters. The Brown Hill one has 1,709 square meters. Only 25% was the footprint of the Brown Hill Road substation. If you look at the aerial view, look at the aerial view. And you can see the size of the enclosure footprint and how it is contained within that compound. This is the conduit insulator that has been used over there. These are the NCIT, um, which, is a, which has been used again, which is a non-conventional instrumentation, instrument transformer that has been used. This is the type. Look at the surrounding. Look at the green surrounding. They have kept the environment intact. They have not at all bothered the environment. They have not played with the environment. They have built their infrastructure within the environment. So the transition station is included in the surrounding of the environment without jeopardizing the environment that that uh, the consumers were used to and this is the only tower in which has been included this is the transition tower that new zealand has in introduced this is the termination tower that was constructed when we had the construction and the final thing that they show. And if you look carefully, 
of um, this, um, uh, as I told you, the Mirbach had 17 meters, 22.1 meter, and 30 meters. There were six staggered one. In Jackson Road, it was 4,600 square meter of footprint. In Monash Freeway, it was 8,700 square meters. And do you know, at 2012, in order to build these two transition stations, Mirwak did the sum, and they came up with around $10 million at that time. This is what the Mon Monash Freeway end looked like, according to Mirwak's proposal. And look at the Brown Hill wall. Look at the comparison between the two. This is the one which is the uh, Mirwak proposal. And look at the one at, look at how small the picture is. The size, the footprint is much smaller than that of, um, uh, of um, um, Mirwak. As I told you, they only had four uniform poles per enclosure. And the height of the pole was only 20 meters. And the footprint is only 1,709 square meters. And they had a lot less financial cost. If you look at the Brown Hill site, and if you had the aerial view of that, you would find that they used the high pressure fluid filled pipe system, which is a pressurizing plant maintaining fluid pressure in the pipe. The number of pressurizing plant depends on the length of the underground. And this can be located within the substation. It included a reservoir that holds a reserve fluid. And they had a high pressure gas filled system, which does not use a pressurizing plant, but rather a regulatory and nitrogen cylinder. They use a regulator and nit nitrogen cylinder. These are in gas cabinet that contains high pressure and low pressure alarms and a regulator. The XLP system does not require any pressurization facilities. At 400 and 500 kV, the size and weight of terminations and the necessary clearances dictate the use of separate high security transition compound on the ground. The compound can require an area of 2,500 square meters, depending on the power level and the amount of equipment installed. The overhead line tower of this location is more substantial because of the line termination at this point, and hence the mechanical forces on the tower are unbalanced. This is the 400 kV transition compound, a classical example. This is what was proposed. Look at that. This is my proposal to put this. Can you see that yellow line? To put that underground. So those properties which were in close proximity to this one are going to be impacted if that overhead line, which is that yellow line, remains overground. So now let me look at the cost to underground the high voltage power line. And remember, I'm talking about 2012. And then the second time I did was in 2016. And I suggested two solutions. And I suggested solutions which were alternative to the proposal that Mirvac claim would be needed. Especially, I suggested that let's have tower-mounted termination and let's have a more practical transition enclosures. And the proposals were advanced as a direct rebuttal to an incorrect observation made by the Waverly Park Transmission Line Advisory Committee. And this was the minister at that time, who I told you the opposition leader today in the state government of Victoria, the Honorable Matthew Guy. And they said the transmission enclosures were first mentioned in 2001 and has been a subject of discussion, analysis, estimation, and reporting from a number of engineering firms. And the main transmission company, which is the Austinet service, have been involved in such discussion from the start. So it's not that they have not bought. The committee was satisfied that the transmission enclosure, as they are 
currently configured are the most appropriate engineering solution if the underground option is to proceed. And that if any other viable options have been available, they would have been presented by now. As I told you, I put my report, and that report was not put to the committee or the tribunal. However, and even though the 220 kV transmission line lend themselves to tower-mounted termination, this not the preferred solution for purposes of current witness statement. Instead, the preferred solution for Waverly Park is a more practical transition enclosure model on the Brown Hill Road substation, which is there in New Zealand. And I, my preference was threefold. It was practical, and our surrounding was very, very similar, geographically, regionally, et cetera, with New Zealand. And it, it has been implemented in Europe and North America. You'd be surprised. And someone asked the question about the financial. The financial was a lot lower than what Mirvac was talking about. And from a public amenity point of view, the brown hole road scenario is very similar to that existing on the Waverly Park tank. So there's no difference at all between the one which is there in New Zealand and the Waverly Park state. Now I want to do the comparison. Remember, Mirvac suggested 8,700 square meters of footprint on the Monash Freeway side. On the Jackson Road side, they suggested 4,600 meters square. They had six staggered poles, 17 meters, 22.1 meters, and 30 meters. The preferred alternative solution that I suggested was to construct two transition stations in the same location that Mirvac had suggested. But I modeled it on Brown Hill Road substation in Auckland. And my substation, which was there, my footprint that I had on both the side, whether it was in Jackson's Road side or Monash Freeway Road side, compared to 8,700 square meters and 4,600 square meters, it was just 1,709 square meters. Roughly about a third of Jackson's Road side and a sixth of Monash Freeway side. And instead of six staggered poles, I suggested smaller poles of 20 meters high. And having instead of six poles, I suggested four poles. And look at the cost implication. And this is all done in, in, in 2016 dollars. Now, let me look at some of the solutions and look at that carefully because I've done it in, in various periods. And on my left hand side, I've got Mirvac solution. On my right hand side, I've got my solution, which I'm calling the alternate solution. And I'm looking, and I'm looking for two times in 2012 and 2016. In 2012 is 5th of October. In 2016, it's 5th November. Monash line deviation, according to Mirvac solution, would have cost about $1.15 million in 2012. In 2016, it would cost about $1.24 million. According to me, in 2012, it should not be more than $1 million. And in 2016, it was $1.1 million. The Jackson Road deviation, exactly in the same manner. Look at that. I saved substantial amount of money, around $200,000 in Jackson's Road deviation. I saved about $100,000 in the Monash deviation. In the transition tower, they predicted $5 million. I predicted about $3.5 million. I saved one and a half million dollars over there. On the Jackson Road trans transition, I saved about 
again 1.2 to 1.5 million dollars the cable itself the cost of the cable which was 20 million and when I did the sum, it only came to about 13 to 14 million. So there was seven million dollars different. So if you look at it carefully, my total cost, if you look at it carefully, I easily saved 10 million dollars in 2012 compared to 11 million dollars in 2016. I also allowed for contingency like risk, etc. of of $1.5 million, which was about half the price of what was suggested by Mirvac. Mirvac total cost in 2012 would have been $36 million, whereas mine was $23 million. So there was $13 million difference. In 2016, Mirvac solution was based on $39 million. Mine was $26 million. So again, it was $13 million different. So now you might ask, what basis have you done all these? First of all, I want to tell you, it was me who did all the estimation. So I take all the blame and all the credit. I did $2,012 amount and translated into $2,016 using historical Australian computer consumer price in this data and an index of 110 for December quarter of 2016 and an index of 102 for the December quarter of 2012. I used a 10% contingency for my alternative solution and this is in guideline of IECOM class 3 estimates. So I did exactly with the guideline. The visual amenity and this is one of the major justification Mirvac advanced for retaining the Waverley Park 220 kV transmission line under above ground was that overhead option removed the requirement for unsightly infrastructure. And this is what was written in the advisory committee report on pages 16 and 17 when it says when it says the proposed amendment removes the requirement to construct above ground unsightly transition enclosures and associated electrical infrastructure on the frontage of Jackson Road and the Monash Freeway. Removing the requirement to construct these transition enclosures will greatly improve the appearance of these areas and the amenity of existing and future residents and commuters along Jackson Road and Monash Freeway. In particular, the transition enclosure adjacent to Jackson Zoo would have caused a detrimental impact to the amenities of residents outside Waverly Park on the east side of Jackson Road, where existing dwelling would face the transition enclosures. Removing the need for a transition enclosures adjacent to Jackson Road would also improve significant appearance of Waverly Park from the Jackson Road. This is what the advisory committee wrote and this is what Mirvac asserted. The advisory committee agreed with Mirvac's 2015 submission and it says if the transmission lines are down, there'll be no tower in the center of easement corridor. However, the transition enclosures could create significant new visual amenity impacts for the two abutting residential precincts. These enclosures will have new and intrusive public ram impacts and are undesirable having regard to the urban design objectives and philosophy for Beverly Park. This is what was agreed by the court. Notwithstanding Mirvac's claims and advisory committee support for these claims, it is not a foregone conclusion that transition enclosures will inevitably fall within the category of unsightly infrastructure. <coughs> I must remind everyone that we have completed the Olympic Park substation in Sydney and we have upgraded the Richmond Terminal Station and we have done this very clearly. The Mirvac of of Waverly Park State had originally intended to underground the transmission line and that's why they had the the structure that's why they had that state 
they had to build 530 meters of buried cable between two locations. But because of the fact of, of saving money, Mirvac proposal was ultimately abandoned. And they did a realigned transmission line, which is above ground. And this made the residents who were living adjacent to the power line very angry. And they said that they did that because they wanted to improve the visual amenity, open space, and financial cost. So they used the word visual amenity. I leave it to your imagination whether putting it underground with two transition towers is less intrusive or more intrusive than putting an overhead line. Naturally, the report has been framed within the context of comparing Mirvac's original undergrounding proposal. And I proposed an alternative, and I gave them an underground solution. I used the same model, which is a practice model in New Zealand, an existing model in New Zealand. I also said that a public amenities perspective the Brown Hill Road scenario, very similar to that of Waverley Park Estate. And definitely, it demonstrates a superior visual immunities and open space and financial cost. I told you I saved about $13 million. And let me tell you some of the advantages that I had. If you looked at the polls, they were 33% less. The pole height, 33% shorter. The compound footprint, 80% shorter in Mon Monash Freeway site, smaller. Jackson's Road site, 63% smaller. Financial cost was 33% cheaper. <clears throat> and therefore, I rest my case to you. I rest my case to you to tell you that my friends, it is not what is there. It is at the end who wins the case. As I told you before, Mirvac won the case against the state government of Victoria. Mirvac won the case against the tenants. This case went twice to the court and both time Mirvac won. Ultimately, the property still has a 220 kV overhead transmission line, which violated the very principle of the sale that went to the sale of Mirvac property. With that, I conclude my presentation. Riley, I'm all done. Thank you, Akta. That was that was really appreciated. Thank you very much for that. Um, there are so many questions. I'm sorry, Riley. I could not read that and. And no, my presentation simultaneously. That's, that's can I, if you can go through some of the questions, I can try and answer as much as possible. Yep. Um, we'll if just go through some. a few slides um, and uh, we'll just yes. have a QA and a session um, just right at the end. Um, yeah. So I, I'm, I'm cautious of the time. And I did tell you I will be just an hour, just under an hour. And I did take just under an hour, two no, minutes less than an hour. It's perfect. Thank you for that. Um, so to everyone that's still in the session, so I'd just like to let you know we have a couple of um, upcoming webinars you might want to attend. Um, so next week we've got a uh, an information session on our Doctor of Engineering um, that we offer. Um, so if you are, uh, if you have considered uh, doing a doctor of engineering before um, or if you've got a master's degree uh, that might that might be for you um, so just have a look at that on our website if you're interested in that um, I can provide the link uh, to our webinars in the chat box and for the other webinar, so that's a technical topic webinar. So um, if you're interested in gas turbines or maybe you're in the mechanical engineering field, uh, that, that might be good. That's in a couple of weeks time. Um, but yeah, as I said, 
if you want to check out any of these webinars, please go to our website um, or use the link um, that I've provided in the chat box. Now, um, I'd just like to run over just some upcoming uh, EIT courses in the field of electrical engineering. Um, we have a couple of advanced diplomas starting very soon um, in the next couple of weeks. And uh, we also have a couple of uh, professional certificate courses. Um, those are just short three month courses. Um, those ones are starting at the start of November. And then uh, early next year, we have um, our higher education program starting. So we've got graduate certificates, uh, masters and bachelor's degrees um, starting in January um, online. And then we also have on-campus programs uh, for Australia uh, that are starting in February. So just have a look on our website if uh, you're interested in that. And also um, our sister company, IDC Technologies, is running a virtual conference, a half-day virtual conference on the 7th of October. Uh, this is a paid um, event and uh, the, link, um, the link is there uh, on the slides or you can visit um, IDC Technologies website if you're interested in attending that. Uh, Professor Akhtar Kalam will also be uh, will also be in that conference um, among other uh, uh, presenters. So have a look at that if you're interested. And for the certificate of attendance for this session, uh, now just put that on the screen. So um, if you have your uh, your smartphone there, you can uh, you can scan the QR code on the screen, and that will take you to a short uh, form or survey. Um, in which you'll need to complete um, in order to receive your certificate attendance uh, for this session. I will also provide the link in the chat box right now. So that link will take you to the short uh, form of survey I just mentioned. And uh, once you complete that form, uh, certificate of attendances will be sent out in the next uh, one to two business days. Um, so, and finally, uh, we'll just do a quick uh, Q&A session. Um, so it looks like most people are still in the session, so that's great. If anyone does have any technical questions for Professor Akhtar Kalam um, or just general questions uh, for me, uh, just pop them in the chat box and, uh, and we'll try and answer them for you while we're still live. Uh, but otherwise, if you... Um, if you need to go or, uh, or you don't have any questions uh, for today, then uh, thanks, thanks for attending. And um, all of our contact details are on the screen there uh, if you wish to contact us. Uh, Steve, uh, all, everyone registered for this webinar will receive a copy of the presentation slides and the link to the video recording. Um, via email in the next one to two business days. Um, so yeah, as I said, if anyone has any uh, technical questions or general questions uh, for either Akta or, um, or myself, uh, please just post them in the chat box and we'll, um, we'll try and answer them for you. Yeah, uh, Akta, I think uh, we've got a question regarding um, optical fiber cables for uh, for power transmission. Um, you can. The answer is yes, you can. And 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 the and the optical fiber could be used for the for the communication part of the thing. So you would insert the optical fiber within the cable itself, and that's being done. Thanks. There was one very good question which I saw before, and that was, was there any kickback? Um, there was someone asked that question. I don't know whether that person is still there or not. Um, I really don't know, and I don't want to get involved in, in that politics. But definitely something went wrong. Something went wrong. The reason why I say something went wrong is that the whole project was based, that is why Mirwak got that that project is a huge project 
can you understand it is built in 19 sections and um, so Mirvak got that for a very cheap price and the whole idea was to put the overhead line underground and uh, yes uh, uh, you need strong will um, someone asked that question yes definitely the government was very strong the previous government which was there was very strong they would not agree with it but there was a change in government and with the change in government the new government did not understand and they gave the approvals i don't know whether there were kickbacks or not and i don't want to get involved into something that i don't know but definitely something went wrong who lost at the end it was not the government who lost it was the people who bought the properties hundreds and hundreds and think thousands of properties were there and they all lost the builders is smiling to the bank that's all i can say uh, how devastating are the impacts of on the environment absolutely not there's no devastation at all i told you i gave you the example of the brown hill one and i showed you that there is no impact at all as a matter of fact the footprint is exactly mixing with the environment i showed you that and yes uh, mirvac in particular built a, a football field sorry a small uh, basketball field and a small lake they have pro pro provided but they still have the overhead line over that now it's up to you to decide whether that was a good thing or a bad thing I don't want to make a comment on that definitely there is something and I can tell you this is a classical case that can happen in any country to any particular group and someone made a mickey out of the government the problem with under is fault finding this makes no it is not at all nowadays there are instruments where you can do the fault finding very easily you don't have to you can find the faults and the accuracy is less than one percent you can find the fault within less than one percent accuracy is very strong there are meters available where you can find the location of the fault within one percent error that you can have so definitely it is not an issue at all i don't believe that's an issue the issue over here was purely money that's all was there it had nothing to do with fault location with scenario with visual amenities it was purely money and as i told you i've done the 2012 figure and 2016 figure Someone made 13 million extra dollars and it paid them to stay. It saved 13 million dollars to the builders. That's all I can say. And the builder actually did not even spend that. They saved more than 13 million dollars because they did not put any underground cable. They just made a nice park over there. That's all they've done. They left the overhead line as it is. So, yes yes rule it can be my alternative solution and now royal i can tell you right now that my solution although at that time taking all into consideration although it was 20 to 23 million dollars i can tell you right now of the track sort of thing and and not committing myself to it i can tell you it can be built much more cheaper now than what was in 2016. There is no issue of maintenance in in underground cable. In Australia, we have a nice saying: anything underground that you can't see, there's no problem. Isn't the overhead line a hazard to the? Yes, it is, Mangani. It is. It is a hazard. That is why the government wanted that overhead line to be underground. That was the whole idea behind it. That is why they got the price so cheap. That was the whole idea behind it. Mangani, I mean, that was exactly what was the issue. I'm, I'm trying to look at the question. If there's any question coming up, I'll try to look and try to read it as quickly as possible. Uh, very hard. I can only see what I can see. 
um, uh, isn't over right now. I mean, I've answered that. Yes, I think so. Uh, how are maintenance costs for the underground cable to the overhead line? Because in underground cable, it's under the ground and there is life expectation, expectancy between 25 to 40 years. The maintenance cost is nil. How devastating are the impacts of an underground EHV cable fault on the environment? Not at all. Okay. Need strong political will? Absolutely, Abraham. You are absolutely right. Can we continue with transmission line but use the tunnel as compared to cables? Yes, you can. Why not? Can I have the link to blah, 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 blah? Can we have the optical? I have answered that. How can we get our certificate? Do you give sponsorships on master's level? That's something that Riley can answer. Thanks, but, uh, um, courses, we, uh, uh, courses, Riley will answer that, Krishnil. We do have a range of um, partial scholarships. Uh, some are applicable to our master's programs. Uh, you can have a look uh, at those scholarships on our website. I'll just pop the link in the chat box there. Um, each scholarship has different entry uh, eligibility requirements. Um, so you'll need to look at the specific uh, scholarship page for that. Then uh, Mahdi has asked, best designs are sometimes shot down by those in power. You're absolutely right. That is how I was shot down. How devastating impact on the, on the environment? I told you there is no impact at all. As a matter of fact, that's the best solution. It solves most of the impact of the population. I suspect there were some kickbacks. I don't believe there were some kickbacks. There were huge kickbacks. I'm structured with them, enjoying it. Thank you very much for enjoying electrical engineering, Lamoti. Uh, uh, up, up. I'm just going through all the questions, Riley. If you give me two minutes, I should finish all of that. No worries. Uh, Mahdi, the solution was not adopted. I am telling you right now. The first time when I gave the solution, it was it was hidden under the cover. Second time, there was a settlement in which uh, uh, the Mirwak was supposed to pay eighty-four thousand dollars to the to the those who are in household people. They they decided not to pay it. Then there's a long one. The overhead system is much more flexible than uh, blah, 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 blah. Yes, uh, you can, Mivila, you can do that. But uh, underground cable uh, has is more appealing in an urbanized environment. I was talking about an urbanized environment. I don't think in Australia in particular, we can make all overhead lines underground because we've got a huge country. There's 9,000 kilometers of overhead line. I've done one study of converting all our overhead line into underground cable. It costs us $20 billion and it's not possible. Excavation will be once, of course, unlikely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, for is it possible to use aluminum more than the copper? It, we do use aluminum, uh, Rina. We do use aluminum. That's why we, I use the word ACSR. It's aluminum conductor, which is steel reinforced, which is used for our overhead line. We do use aluminum. Um, no, I don't think so. The excavation, these are now machineries, and, and uh, these are all in existence. The only problem is traffic. The traffic will be a problem. Less resistance, higher current, blah, 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 blah. And, uh, yep, that's right. There will be a link to short form where uh, Kylie requests a certificate. Um, common place to use. Yep, it's, it's all right. Copper is still a preferred option. Yeah, but uh, we are using aluminum. Should I see those undergoing questions are without any joints? Yes, there's no joints. Yes, so if you have a problem, that's where uh, we will have a bit of a problem because technical people, Justine, are not available who can do the jointing properly. Uh, they are a bit of a problem. 
yes, I agree with you, Tamba, to use aluminium than copper. I don't know why Peter the 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 audio was breaking. Uh, I'm sure Peter is was from your side because most of the people could hear me properly. Maintenance can be done easily. Uh, we have got systems in place. Um, yes, uh, yes, uh, it is easier to do overhead lines, uh, but um, the challenge is uh, overhead lines because of the visual amenities will not be accepted in an outward environment. I told you and uh, in the olden days, uh, Themba in the olden days, uh, overhead lines was uh, one third the price of, um, of underground cable. Now it is not that. Now the price are very, very much similar. Yes, it was never joined um, Temba. I'm glad, Kenneth, that you are enjoying it from Papua New Guinea. And Duke, uh, you in South Africa, good to hear from you. And someone from Botswana, fantastic. Uh, the, the slide will be sent by uh, by um, Riley and Riley will organize that. I think uh, I've covered all questions, uh, Riley. Uh, I don't know whether I'm going fast enough or not. I don't want to bore anyone, but I think I've covered all the questions that I could think of. There are hundreds of questions, literally. Riley, can I get uh, these questions? Uh, can you shoot them to me just in case if I miss something? But I don't think so. I've covered everyone. Riley, I've done that. Thanks, Akta. There's just a, been a few questions come in over the last five minutes or so. Um, just at the bottom of the chat box, uh, you'll find a few more, I think. Um, I think, yeah, there's just been a few questions come in in the last five minutes. Um, Riley, you're making me run for the money, isn't it? <laughs> um, but if... Uh, if anyone does have any um, any questions at all, uh, you can also email me. Um, my email address is on the on the slides at the moment. So, um, if you have any questions, very, very interesting question, Riley. This mm. is about uh, problems during earthquake. Only yesterday in Melbourne we had earthquake. Mind you, my friend, we had an earthquake uh, which was um, in the Richter scale was six and 5.5 was in Melbourne city where I live in and 60 kilometers away from me in Mansfield it was six. Believe me, none of our underground cable suffered. There was no problem at all with earthquake. As a matter of fact, underground cabling is very much congenial with earthquake problems. So earthquake does not make any issue. As a matter of fact, it is very friendly and there's no issue. As a, I can tell you that you will have problems in earthquake and typhoon and cyclone. You will have overhead lines flying all over. What is the most economical medium of transmission for underground installation? XLPE cable. XLPE cable, Alfredo. Uh, in underground cable, sexualization can be achieved on different sections. You can work on it. Thank you very much, Mohammed uh, Abu Bakr, uh, that you're working in 22 kV structure. I hope this was of some use. Monopole line, North South, the Monai Freeway were your solution. Yes. Yes, uh, Billy. Uh, Darian said their current projects contribute where there are serious environments for overhead lines. Like, yes, exactly right, Darren. This huge problem, and, and in particular, in the rural area, you have got swear line. You know that uh, swear line is single wire earth return line in country Victoria. We are very good at that, but they are becoming they are becoming an issue nowadays. And I think uh, 
we have to look seriously at some other solution. Isn't there more cost implication? No, I told you, Oluwesi. I told you it was about 10 years back. It was about 10 years back. Underground solution was three times more expensive. No longer underground solution is more or less in par with, uh, with the underground cable. Will people be allowed to build houses on top? Um, yes, and not on top, but in close proximity, because as I told you right in the beginning, Steve, we believe that if you can't see, there's no problem. When this, uh, for how is the maintenance that when it crosses the city? Uh, most of the cities have got Udak. Uh, most of the cities have got underground cable, and there's no issue of maintenance. Cost, maintenance, safety, and durability. Cost, similar. Maintenance lot lower because the impact is not uh, the impact of uh, force, etc., a lot lower. Safety is much better. Uh, durability is much longer than overhead line. The life of a overhead line is 25 to 30 years, whereas the life of overhead underground cable is 40 years. Will people be allowed to build houses? Yes, I've answered all that question. Thanks, Akta. I think um, I think you've answered all the questions, or most of the questions anyway, in the session. Um, I believe that's all we have time for everyone. So thank you very much for attending today. Um, as I said, if uh, if anyone wants to contact us, uh, please uh, please refer to the co uh, the contact details on the screen. Uh, but otherwise, uh, have a great rest of your day wherever you are. Uh, and thank you very much. And thanks, Professor Akhtar Kalam. That was a great presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having us. And it has been great talking to you. And again, I think next week I'm giving that presentation jointly with Dr. Ali Zadeh, I hope. I hope yeah. it's still there. Absolutely. I mean, after some time, Riley, you people will get fed up of me. <laughs> no, never, Akhtar. <laughs> thank you very much. Bye-bye. All right, take it easy. Bye-bye. Take it easy. Take, take care.